Uh, it's so great to see everyone here. You know, I don't often take a lot of time to reflect uh, on the past because uh, I, I, I spend a lot of my time moving forward. But I have given a little bit of reflection to what CAGLA has accomplished in the last few years. And my relationship with Chad Landry started, I guess, about four, four and a half years ago when he came to my office for a meeting. And I have a lot of meetings throughout the week, and uh, most of them don't actually add up to too much at the end of the day, uh, to tell you the truth. So, some do. But I had no idea at that time when Chad Landry came to my office and said, do you have any ideas for legislation that might benefit cancer patients where this would go? Looking out at the audience today, standing room only, uh, I had, could never have envisioned what has happened over the last few years. And uh, you know, it's, it's taken all of us, everybody in this room, to make this happen. But one more than any, any other, and that's Chad Landry. And when I think about... <laughs> And when I think about Chad Landry, I think about perfectionism. He, he always drives us to do better and better and better and think about the next thing. Persistence and persistence and persistence and persistence. You know, I think if you say, what's the secret sauce? You know, uh, perfectionism, persistence. But at the end of the day, passion, passion. It really is a, a true heart for making things better in this state for our cancer patients. And for that, I'm truly grateful. It's wonderful to have you as a friend and a colleague in this, in this journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. Uh, today, we are joined by Dr. Amir Ali Talasaz. Uh, Dr. Talasaz is the co-founder and co-CEO of Garden Health. Garden Health is one of the largest genetic testing companies in the world. Uh, they have a market cap of $2.5 billion in operations throughout the Americas, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Talasaz received a PhD from Stanford University. Uh, he went on to become a senior leader at Illumina and then founded Garden Health, and the rest is history. So I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Talasaz to the stage. Okay, all right. Can you hear me okay? We thought we'd do something a little bit different uh, with, this, with this session, this first session. And that is, uh, instead of a uh, PowerPoint presentation, we really thought we'd kind of pick uh, the brain of uh, a, a real a genius in this, in, this, uh, in this space. And so I'm going to give you guys a chance to ask some questions, but I'd like to start with a few questions myself. Uh, when we think about genetic testing, particularly next generation sequencing in cancer, we know how important this is. The guidelines tell us it's necessary. It saved millions of lives by getting people on the appropriate therapies that are often, uh, often a little closer. Okay, how's that? That sounds better. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, it often improves patients' quality of life dramatically. But when you look at the numbers. Less than half the cancer patients in this country get guideline-based next-generation sequencing. So why is that? Is it, is it access? Is it education? And how do we change it? Uh, like as an example, like something which is very related to the topic of conversation is this biomarker bill that was passed uh, in this state. Frankly, it became a roadmap for many other states in the country, not only you guys have changed the life of cancer patients in this state better. I can tell you now there are 15 other states that they follow those footsteps and they have now this kind of biomarker testing bills passed and uh, some of them actually enacted right now. So a huge kudos to all the pioneering work that you guys have done. Now, going to this actually critical question, like. There is a lot of innovation that has been done in this field. There is a lot of clinical evidence that have been generated. But how come those innovative technologies, those breakthroughs, are not making the impact that they really deserve to make? An example is next generation sequencing, especially in the field of oncology. There is some fundamental gaps in the health system from innovation, 
evidence generation, even FDA approval, even guideline inclusion to access. When we are looking at some of the stats that, you know, I think there were some kind of new reports in non-small cell lung cancer. Some very recent studies by Precision Coalition is 64% of non-small cell lung cancer patients that they have actionable biomarkers that have treatment management uh, implication, 64% of them are not getting those target therapies. And we know what the outcome benefit would be. Like some uh, randomized study has shown that the overall survival in lung cancer could go up significantly if you put the patient on the right therapy. And 64% are not getting those therapies. Some of it starts from like broad issue of access, the payer dynamics, the physician education. And are we doing the best that we can to make sure those innovation goes to the patients, especially the patients who are the most in need. I think really the path forward continues to be a very strong partnership from private, public, and especially actually some government effort kind of uh, parties. And one of the key players in that private public partnerships are advocates and patient advocacy groups. That's what we need. We need to step up our games. We are making great progress, but still a lot is left. And I could see a brighter future if we work together in a very more meaningful way. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to ask you now to take out your crystal ball. So, <laughs> NGS is obviously the standard of care. Uh, it has changed uh, cancer care dramatically. But what do you think is the next big thing? Is it, is it uh, CRISPR? Is it proteomics? Uh, what, what's just over the horizon? Maybe I can answer that from all fronts in terms of maybe the next wave of innovative technologies and maybe I can put a crystal ball in terms of hope of what we can do to make sure those innovative technology become accessible at the end. Sounds good? So just maybe look at the progress we made on NGS. I remember these stats. In fact, it was part of our submission to Medicare when we got actually a Medicare coverage for our liquid biopsy CGP test for lung cancer years back, I think 2015, that the rate of CGP testing, comprehensive genomic profile testing, was about 8% in lung cancer in 2014-2015. Now, we made good progress. It's about actually uh, just a little bit over 50%, but still there is uh, a lot to make progress. So what would be the next big thing? At Gardent, we are very excited of what we can do with epigenomics. What is epigenomics? You know, we are talking about genomic analysis. Those are the you know, mutation profile, those are three billion letters that all of our cells, you know, typically have in common. But epigenomics are some chemical changes in the same DNA that differentiate our eye cell with our skin cell with our liver cell. And I think that epigenomic studies, although I've been around for a long time, it's almost a dark matter, especially in the field of oncology, with huge implications. Let me give you an example. How many oncologists do we have in the room? So I, I just get a set up. Okay. Just imagine when you're managing a breast cancer patient with a blood test or tissue test, not only you figure out what kind of biomarker that breast cancer patient has, for instance, does it have ESR mutation right now or not, but also you can figure out, is this patient metastasizing in bone or brain? Just imagine the therapeutic impact of that in terms of the class of treatment and intervention that you're going to decide to do next. This is what we can do with epigenomics, just as an example. 
We are very excited about this. We are adding this epigenomic technologies into our, all of our offering. The whole sector, I think, by m multiple players, even on, uh, even on the academy, is moving in this direction. So I could see within the next 10 years, we understand epigenomics much better, and we would see the utility of epigenomics uh, in, in clinical practice. Now, how to make these innovation technologies at the end accessible, if I want to bring that crystal ball. Just imagine if there are some kind of mechanism that FDA approved technologies, Medicare reimbursed technologies could go through accelerated pathway by payers for consideration of access. Just imagine a day that even NGS or CGP testing would be a quality score by HEDIS in scoring the quality of practice in provider and health systems. We've seen the impact of those measures in improvement of, for instance, colorectal cancer screening. Now imagine if this gets applied to NGS. These would be driving functions to improving accessibility of these innovative technologies to go to the patients who need it the most. That's terrific. I love that idea. That is, that is awesome. My next question, I'm going to qualify by saying it's coming from someone who can barely turn on a computer. <laughs> but it seems to me that AI is affecting everything and is probably over the next few years going to touch pretty much all aspects of, of, of human life. Where does this fit in uh, with cancer care? I think the amount of data that's getting uh, generated now in the field of oncology is going to the levels that we've never imagined before. In oncology, it was a field of being data starved. Now the amount of data that's getting generated is Sometimes it's so much that we don't know even how to analyze it or how to interpret it. And that's one of the contribution of some of these new technologies like artificial intelligence. Just imagine, let's say going back to that epigenomic example I mentioned earlier. You're looking at all epigenomic changes across genome in cancer patients, and you do that across your whole practice and then connect that to the medical record and just see what kind of insight, clinical insight, you can gather from uh, that information. So that's on a geeky technology sciencey part of it. On the productivity, it's not my area of expertise, but what I'm seeing is a new wave of activities, even within our company, that Using AI technologies, you can improve the productivity of scientists. You know, in a company like us, we have tens of thousands of documents for reimbursement regulatory purposes. And sometimes we are putting our best scientists, the best brains of the world, to really write those documents. Just imagine an AI you know, enabled kind of system or empowered system that could really make a good first draft of these documents and our best brains then can you know, make some adjustment as they see fit. Or in oncologist practice, just imagine when you see a patient, you have some kind of system that the genomic profile of that patient can get, com can get compared with the whole practice genomic profile, even locally with state level genomic profile, and at the same time combine it with the best that we know in the literature. Some of these look, you know, hard to do, but with these innovative technologies, the bar and the barrier would go further and further down. That's excellent. That's excellent. You have recently expanded operations at Garden uh, to North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, you already have operations in Asia, of course, throughout the Americas. Uh, as, as you approach these new ventures in these, in these new places, what lessons do you think that we in the United States can learn from what others are doing in other countries as far as the approach to genomics and, and cancer care? 
So yeah, actually we are in about more than 50 countries, but we recently expanded to those geography. And um, I think some of it is when you're looking at the field of oncology, in order to really have the right impact, you need to have some level of global scale. For instance, when we are partnering with over 160 biopharma partners and they're running some kind of studies or investigation, they would like to work with some kind of partners that they can handle the clinical studies that are happening at the global scale. Now, because of some of those business needs, we kind of scaled our operation and footprint. And we are learning some interesting lessons. I think the power of advocacy groups that sometimes we see in some communities are maybe we can extract some lessons from them. They, in some countries, like just based on the infrastructure of their health system, some stuff can get never done unless there is a big advocacy support behind them. So we are seeing some of that. The reality of underserved patient population, how you can bring some of the practices to underserved patient population. Like some of the stuff that here we are hearing a little bit, for instance, you know, mobile phlebotomy. In some geos, if you don't have mobile phlebotomy, you cannot do even some of the basic practices. Uh, what we call here in terms of ride sharing, how could we like, you know, uh, help tra with transportation support in, under, you know, in other countries, that's really the family and advocate kind of ride sharing. But if you don't have those basic elements of ride sharing, the clinical care is gonna get heavily impacted. So by observing some of those and kind of bringing some of those observation into the operation in the United States, I think we can generate some kind of benefits. That's terrific. That's terrific. You know, one aspect of genomics, uh, particularly as it relates to cancer, that has generated a lot of interest uh, throughout the community is blood-based screening for cancer. And uh, I can tell you an anecdotal story um, that happened at our practice. I actually did a very short segment on the morning news one morning about, um, about multi-cancer early detection. And when I, and, uh, I, I saw Thaisa here earlier. Thaisa saw, yeah, there's, there's Thaisa. She remembers this day, right? She remembers that day very, very well, because uh, Thaisa is sort of the, 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 the front line of our, our phase one clinic. And I walked into clinic that morning, and the phone was ringing off the hook. In fact, we had 2,000 patients call the clinic that morning. The CEO's office was calling us and saying, the phone systems are exploding. What is going on? We had no idea this one little segment would generate that much uh, uh, interest. In fact, we uh, took every one of those patients' names and numbers, uh, put them on a list, and it took uh, weeks, even months, to get to each one of those uh, uh, those, those phone calls. It was astronomical. The, the, uh, uh, the community is hungry for this. Now, uh, a lot of companies are, are, are trying to play in this space. Um, Garden's taking a, a fairly unique approach. Um, a lot of companies are looking at broad panels, looking at many different types of cancer from a single blood test. You guys are focusing on, on colon cancer for a blood-based screening test. Could you explain what you're doing and, and why you're taking that particular approach? Yes, yeah, sure. So scientifically, with a simple blood test, you can find early sign of multiple cancers in blood. Not only even cancers, there are evidence in scientific literature that maybe we can find early onset of multiple diseases all at the same time within the same blood test. But just imagine if you have a, again, great innovative technology that you can do multiple diseases at early onset, but then nobody can get access to it. What would be the level of impact that we could have outside clinical trials or the people with the highest accessibility to financial power that maybe they can purchase those kind of services? 
that's one way. It's a viable kind of a uh, model that some of our um, uh, some other companies are pursuing. At Garden, we always have this mission that, okay, let's do innovation, but count your success by the amount of lives that you have impacted at the end. In order to really do that, it's very hard to skip the pathways for reimbursement and FDA approval and guideline inclusion to, at the end, make sure this test would be accessible. And then we need to be considerate of the structure of the health system that we are playing in. Like the reality of CMS in the United States is for a simple cancer screening test. They cannot, they cannot write coverage policies except for couple cancer types. They cannot. We like it, we dislike it, they cannot. So what have we done when we studied the whole landscape of accessibility pathways and how could we make sure at the end we impact lives at millions of people? We decided to start with the first indication that we can get FDA approval for. CMS can write a coverage policy, which in fact they proactively have written before anybody qualifies for, and pathways for guideline inclusion. So we went after this problem of solving or contributing in increasing the screening rate for colon cancer. It's a major issue by itself. 50 million people in the United States who need to get colorectal cancer screening are not getting it done because many people do not want or don't have access to go through colonoscopy or for different reasons they are not doing stool-based tests. 50 million people. 76% of the people who die with colorectal cancer are from this set of patient population who are unscreened or they are not up to date with their screening program. So that's a major kind of a unmet need that we are trying to solve first, getting FDA approval, get, you know, being the first uh, screening test for the field of colorectal cancer screening get Medicare coverage, there are pathway for that. Go to the guidelines, you know, uh, by, you know, the American Cancer Society guidelines and after that United States Preventative Services Task Force. And literally, we can go to 2025, everybody age 65 and above get access to this test. And 2026, everybody age 45 and above get access to this test with zero dollar out of pocket. That's what equitable access to innovative technology is. So we are starting from that, and then we are adding other indication to the same blood test. That makes so much sense. It really, really does. It makes a lot of sense to try and build something that people can have access to and then add on to. Uh, I, I honestly didn't understand it before, but now I get it. It's clear in my mind. Now, I'm gonna ask one final question. And then I will open it up for a couple of uh, questions from the audience, if anyone uh, wants, to, wants to pick uh, Amir Ali's brain. So we have uh, uh, several trainees in the audience, and I think we'll have more who will watch this on live stream and, and, and the archive presentation. Now, you are uh, an extremely successful scientist, right? Uh, you have founded one of the largest genetics companies in the, in the world. You've been honored uh, by uh, Fortune Magazine as one of their 40, under 40. Uh, you've been named one of Times Magazine's uh, top people, top 50 people in healthcare globally. Uh, what advice would you have to young people um, as they embark on careers in healthcare or in business uh, today? I mean, the first one is, um to make sure you have right teams next to you. Like many of the success that actually he mentioned, frankly, belongs to a team who's around me, frankly. Like the recognition always comes like to, you know, people in charge at the end and, you know, who they're responsible. But I think really this recognition belongs to strong teams that I had the opportunity and fortunate to partner with. So. Make sure you have right set of people around you. And maybe each phase of your career, each phase of progress in your company, 
that set of people are going to be different. Second, uh, the value of uh, mentorship. I always benefited from somebody or somebody's around me to give me advice, mentor me. There are always people who are a couple of steps ahead of you in your journey. Being open to those kind of feedbacks and in fact seeking it. And third, I would say just in terms of operation mode, something I call the philosophy of being a yo-yo. In order to operate at scale, what really helped me is trying like a yo-yo, sometimes deep dive down into the details and sometimes yo-yo up and just have a high level perspective and figuring out the right balance between these two. At some point you need to empower a bunch of other people and just be strategic and at some point you need to be very detail oriented. So these have really been some of the factors that contribute in my sex. Again, go after purpose. A mission with a purposeful impact at the end would give you some boost charge that can drive you during a bunch of up and downs. That, uh, those, those really speak to me, particularly the team. I think the team we built with Cagla is, uh, is second to none, and I think that really engenders, uh, engenders a lot of our success. Okay, go, don't be shy, guys. How about a couple of questions from the audience? We're just going to sit here awkwardly until someone <laughs> stands up. And don't make me call on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody at all? I know it's kind of tough. It's kind of tough in a big crowd like this. Okay, one one last one for me, and then we'll wrap it up. Oh, we did. Oh, go, go for it. So, um, what is the strategy for increasing next generation's testing? Like some of us do it hundred percent, which is mean I mean, but many don't. What should we do to address that? Uh, NGS in the oncology field, yeah. So I think some of the barriers need to get removed step by step. You know, I talked about, for instance, access in terms of payer coverage, but you know, something which um, many of us have even full control. Barriers of uh, time consumption on the physician and patient to do a test ordering and get access to a report. Like for instance, what we've seen, electronic medical record integration. Once you go through that kind of a journey, which needs commitment from both sides of like, you know, the test provider and the provider, then the life of prescribing physician is gonna become much better, easier. The patient access to report becomes easier. And these kind of burdens over time actually would go down, which would really help with utilization of these tests. Because at the end, everybody's resource limited in terms of time, right? So, so there are some barriers that actually I think we can over time remove step by step. I think physician education and uh, patient navigation would also go in a long way. Like, you know, I'm fascinated, I'm hearing like, uh, Oshner and some of the programs around patient navigation. I think in a public-private way, we have to figure out how to help. You know, there are some kind of services which are very important that there are no reimbursement for, so everybody's trying, okay, please, you do it, you take care of it, right? So, but the reality is, if we can do a better job, let's say in patient navigation throughout the journey, the outcomes are going to get improved. The test utilization is going to increase. The quality outcomes for the practice would go higher. So I think there are a few things that still we can do to make, to make sure some of these barriers are removed. Absolutely. And, 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 and I'll just add to that. One of the things that we've done that has really worked in my precision medicine program is we've, we've made this reflexive. And what I mean by that is what percent of patients do I want oncologist ordering NGS on? Zero. Z-E-R-O, zero. Why is that? 
the way we've instituted is if the pathologist looks under the microscope and sees cancer, they look at an algorithm and it tells them order NGS, they press a button, it automatically gets ordered, it automatically reflexively gets done. It, those results appear in discrete form in the electronic medical record by the time the patient meets the oncologist for the first time. I don't want the oncologist meeting the patient for the first time and saying, oh, we got to order NGS. I want those results in front of them the day they meet the patient. In fact, several days before they meet the patient, I want those results in the EMR. So that, that actually works really well for us. Yes, Dr. Ellis. You talked a little bit about educating providers on what your tests do, and I think we're coming along well there. How would you educate administrators who are not used to precision medicine uh, when we're going up the chain of command trying to get programs developed, and I'm having to explain to them what precision medicine is because they're so far removed from clinical practice. The health system administration? Administrators? Yeah. Actually, we have a bunch of good experience and success and failures. I think when I look at some of the success stories are the ones that we worked strongly as a team. Local regional KOL, the doctors within that practice of what we would like to see, and providers like us, and you know, making sure that we have a proposal, a program proposal that can convince administrators that it's in the roadmap of what they are trying to do within their health system. For instance, when at Oshner, for instance, or in this state, I'm hearing that you know, we are at number, of, like in mid 40s, we wanna go to like mid 20s. Okay, there are, if that is on top of the mind of administrators in the health system, there are some progressive activities that you can do. For instance, in lung cancer, very recently in NCCN guidelines, now it's recommended that you can consider doing both tissue testing and blood testing at the same time to make sure you're really catching these actionable biomarkers and in a timely fashion, because sometimes tissue takes a long time, sometimes tissue fails, sometimes blood fails, right? And each one of them always miss a fraction of biomarkers, right? So if then, you know, there is a program that, that the health system can get administrated that once a patient is diagnosed, then let's make sure we are ordering based on guideline recommendation both of these or whenever, like, you know, we get the first information, we can stop the other one, doesn't matter. But the point is, sticking to that guideline that proves the outcome benefit, getting support through the local oncologists and regional KOLs, when that system works very strongly together, we've seen good progress with the health systems. It's a great question, great question. Anybody else? Are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm an optimistic person, so maybe just kind of discount you know, some of the stuff I say, but I really um, believe the future of health and gardening wellness would be bright. When we are looking at right now, out of four trillion dollars that we are spending in the healthcare in the United States, about three trillion of it, is for managing sickness and managing symptoms. And about a trillion about you know, wellness and prevention and delaying diseases. And then the innovative technology that I see, I could really see within a couple decades we can flip that instead of being a health system to manage sickness, we can restore wellness and manage sickness at the same time, adjust the healthcare cost, improve the outcomes in a very, very meaningful way, have happier life, healthier life for everybody. And especially in the field of oncology, when you look at, we can detect cancers earlier. We can find early sign of relapse earlier. We can treat the patients actually more precise. We have tools. There are even better tools coming on some new classes of treatments, but even we are not utilizing our current tools uh, you know, in a great way. When you look at all this stuff which are gonna come to us within the next couple decades, the future is gonna be good. We need that for our kids, for you know, 
next generation, and that's maybe a way to pay forward. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This has been excellent.